Amen. Thank you. Praise team. Always leading us in worship. It's good to be back. Uh, last week, uh, Jeannie and I left on Friday. We came back on Wednesday. We were at the, the annual ministry leadership conference of the International Baptist Convention. Um, it's a little bit of vacation time. We got a little to see that, that island of Cyprus. That's where Paul had visited there in Acts chapter 13. We got to see some of the places that tradition, anyway, says that he was while he was there. It was an awesome time of just reconnecting with our brothers and sisters around the International Baptist Convention. Most of the churches in the IBC are throughout Europe and uh, some in Africa, Latin America, a couple of them in Asia. Uh, most of the churches are throughout the International Baptist Convention are like ours in the sense that they're the only one of their kind in town. Um, in some cases, the only one of their kind in their country. And so it's good to come together with, with fellow leaders and pastors from those churches, pray together, talk about some of the challenges and some of the successes of ministry. And so know that we have this brotherhood of, of like-minded churches around this part of the world. Uh, we, you can pray for them. We don't necessarily know all of their needs all the time, but God knows them all. To lift up our brothers and sisters as they minister to the English-speaking community overseas, just like ours, and know that they're praying for us as well. So it was a great time of connection, and we're once again thankful for Richard uh, for standing in the pulpit and uh, filling in last week. Now, we are looking forward now uh, to, in just a couple of weeks, to celebrating the resurrection of Christ. We're going to come together on Easter Sunday and celebrate that kind of the pinnacle of, of Jesus' earthly ministry, the resurrection, on Easter Sunday. And following Easter, I'm going to be starting a, a sermon series, a little short five-week sermon series, and I'm calling this, Are You There, God? And we're going to take a look through the book of Esther. Now, Esther has the distinction, if you didn't know this, Esther has the distinction of being the only book in the Bible that does not mention God by name. And I think there's something that, that's powerful about that that answers this question, are you there, God? Mo many of the conclusions that we draw from the, the book of Esther, they don't make any sense if we don't see God's hand at work throughout that book. And we see him fashioning things and moving in ways that aren't obvious. And many times we have those questions in life. God, are you in this? Are you at work? Are you still here? And we don't see the, the burning bush experience. You know, we don't see the, the whirlwind. We don't hear an angel with a trumpet making a grand proclamation. And it's so easy in those times to miss how God is at work. And so I want us to take these, those weeks following Easter and, and work through the, the book of Esther and answer that question, are you there? in the circumstances and, and situations that we find ourselves in in life, when it's not obvious that God is at work, how do we see him at work? And so you invite your friends to join us for Easter. Encourage them to stay for that series after that. Now, between now and Easter, I want us to focus on a couple of the events of that week. We often call it the Passion Week, the week leading up to the crucifixion and the resurrection. I want us to look at a couple of events. And I want us to consider this question as we do. Why are we told about these events? Now, the, the, res, the crucifixion and the resurrection, it's easy to understand why we're told about those. They are the, the pinnacle of Christ's ministry from all the way in eternity past. Those have been the point of Christ's earthly ministry, the crucifixion and the resurrection. And without the crucifixion, the, the ministry of Jesus, quite frankly, is no different from anyone else without the crucifixion. And without the resurrection, as, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, without the resurrection of Christ from the dead, then our faith is useless. Our, our belief has been in vain. It's easy to understand why we know about those events. But we're told about other events in that Passion Week, things that happen during the, the course of that week. And we're going to look at two of them. This morning I want us to look at that, that time that Jesus had with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew chapter 26. So if you've got a Bible with you, take it out, turn there. Matthew, the, for of course, the first book of the New Testament, turn to Matthew, Matthew's Gospel chapter 26. I want us to take a look at that time that Jesus had with his disciples there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then next week I want us to look at his discussion that he has with the other two thieves on the cross, the other two that were crucified on his left and his right, and the discussion that he had uh, with those two. And as we're doing that, I want us to ask this question, why do we know about these things? Everything that Jesus did was intentional. Every ministry opportunity he had, every person that he stopped to and talked with and ministered to was an intentional decision on his part. And he didn't minister to everybody. He walked by some people. Those were intentional decisions on his part. Everything that Jesus did was an intentional decision. 
And everything that we know about in Scripture was an intentional decision on the part of the Holy Spirit. We don't know about everything that Jesus did. In fact, John tells us in John chapter 21 that if everything he did, all the details, all the discussions, all the, the acts that Jesus did on this earth, if all of those were written down, John said, that I, don't, I suppose the world couldn't hold all the books. And that tells me two things. That first of all, we don't know everything that Jesus did. And what we do know is a small fraction of what he did. All the books in all the world couldn't hold all the things that Jesus did. You look at the page count in the Gospels, 91 pages in my Bible, what records the earthly ministry of Jesus. We only know a small fraction of the things that he did. Now, that's something that's telling for us as well, that the, the Holy Spirit did these sort of surgical strikes. There are very intentional decisions on the part of the Holy Spirit. When he inspired these gospel writers to write about certain events, there was a very specific intentional purpose he had. Why this event and not 30 or 50 other ones? Why this one? There were very intentional decisions on the part of the Holy Spirit. And there are a lot of things that we can glean from this one event in the, the Garden of Gethsemane. We could see this certainly as a, as a lesson on perseverance on the part of Jesus. As, as he approached the Garden, he approached the Passion Week, Jesus knew very well what lied ahead. He knew the, the betrayal. He knew the suffering that was to come. He knew the beatings, the mock trial. He knew the cross. He knew everything that was coming. And yet he makes this bold proclamation, not my will but yours be done. We could see that as a lesson on perseverance, that Jesus pressed through the ministry and, the, and the, the, the work that God the Father had for him to do. We could see it as a teachable moment on commitment, or maybe a more uh, teachable moment on the lack of commitment, looking at the disciples. This account in Matthew's gospel, when they're in the garden, comes right on the heels of that, that bold proclamation of Peter. Not only will I not deny you, but I would die for you if necessary. And we're told there in verse 35 that all the disciples said the same thing. Yea, I'm with Peter on this. I'll die for you if necessary, Lord. And then we come into this account. Jesus says, stay here and watch while I go and pray. They can't even stay awake for an hour. We could see it as a, a, a lesson on lack of commitment. Certainly a model prayer is that, that phrase of Jesus rings out in our ears, not my will, but yours be done. But this is how I want us to see it this morning, as a lesson in faith. Jesus' prayer, that phrase, not my will, but yours be done. That's, that's a, a declaration of dependence on God, isn't it? It's, it's a, a declaration of his, his unquestioned trust in the Father. A declaration of his submission and surrender. That's what faith is, isn't it? Our declaration of our dependence on God. Our declaration of our trust in him. Our submission and surrender to him. That's what faith is looks like. I want us to see this as a, a lesson on faith. And given that the Holy Spirit marked this event for us to know about, in all four Gospels, by the way, we're told about this one event. And so given that the Holy Spirit marked this event for us to know about, I want us to ask this question. What lessons in faith does God have for us that he saw fit that we know about this one brief encounter in the Garden of Gethsemane? Well, I know that was a very long introduction. Gave you plenty of time to find Matthew chapter 26. And so I want us to look at some of the lessons of faith. And the first one I think is this. To make God your first stop, not your last resort. To make God your first stop, not your last resort. Several years ago, this was when people actually used books with actual paper and cover and pages and such. I was in a Christian bookstore and I saw a bookmark in the bookstore and it showed this, this sad-looking cat. He was wet, looked like he had gone a couple of rounds in the toilet. He's horrible-looking, pitiful little creature. And he was hanging on to the end of a rope. Now, I don't know how they got him to do that for that picture, because we can't get our cat to do anything we want him to do. Somehow they got this cat to hang on to the end of this rope for this picture. And the poor thing is looking there all pitiful. He's right at the end of the rope. There's a knot at the end. And this was the tagline at the bottom of the bookmark. It said, when you come to the end of your rope, pray. And isn't that how many of us live our Christian life? I've exhausted all other options. I guess I'll ask God to join in on this. I don't know what else to do. I don't know where else to turn. I suppose then since I'm out of options, I ought to see what God has to say about this. Isn't that often how many people live their Christian life? 
I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to come to God. I'm not going to turn to his word until I've come to the end of my rope. Isn't that how many people live their Christian lives? But what did Jesus do? You know, we often ask the question, what would Jesus do? I think a more telling question, what did Jesus do? Verses 36 and 37. And then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. By the way, that word Gethsemane means olive press. So he's going to be pressed down. This is a very, very challenging moment. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and, and the twin son, or the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be grieved and greatly distressed. Notice what he did there in verse 36. When he comes into the garden, what is his intent? What is his focus? What's he going to do when he gets there? Before he begins to be grieved, before he begins to be distressed, what's he going to do? You guys sit here while I go over and pray. He makes his, his time with the Father, connecting with the Father, turning to the Father. That's his first stop. It's not his last resort. It's not after all of that. Father, now I'm completely downcast. I'm distressed. Now I suppose I will come to you. He turns to the Father first. That's his first place to go. This is arguably the darkest, most difficult hour of Jesus' earthly ministry, this time in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows full well, as I mentioned earlier, what lies ahead. He knows the cruelty that faces him. The fact that over the course of the next day, his beard will be pulled out. He knows that's going to happen. He knows about the beatings that are going to happen, the betrayal that's going to happen. He knows what's coming, the mocking, the suffering, the cruelest of the cruel death on the cross. He knows what lies ahead. This is arguably the darkest hour of his earthly ministry. It's a time of intense difficulty. And to say he was distressed might be a, a grand understatement as he comes into this. Luke, Luke's gospel, his account of this event. Now Luke was a doctor. He would have noticed physical things that maybe us mere mortals might not have noticed. Luke notices something that the other gospels don't record. And that in, in this moment, when they're in the garden, Jesus is so distressed, he's sweating droplets of blood. This is a difficult, challenging, pressing moment in Jesus' life. But here's the thing of it. He turns to the Father first. He wasn't defeated. He was distressed, yes. But he doesn't come into this as an, an attitude of defeat because his first stop is to connect with the Father, not his last resort. He's, as Paul would, say, would later say, he was pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. You say, well, yeah, he was Jesus, of course. He, he can do that. You know, he, he was Jesus. How could, could we really do that? Could we really go through such a stressful time, any distress that we're in, the, the most pressing things that we'll face? Well, how can we go through them and experience that same thing? Pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. How can that be real in my life and in your life? Because he turns to the Father first. His coming to God is not an afterthought. His, his connecting with the Father is not, a, oh, by the way, I guess I ought to do this. I haven't come to the end of my rope. He connects with the Father first and fervently. This is not a, a, a throwaway time. This is not a, a meaningless connection with the Father. He connects with Him first and He connects with Him fervently. Verse 40 says that Jesus prayed for an hour. He went, he went away and he came back to his disciples. Couldn't you stay awake for just an hour? He had gone away to pray. He prayed for an hour. Now I won't ask for a show of hands, but when's the last time most of us prayed for anything? For an hour. He prays for an hour. Verse 42 said he did it again. He went away. He said the same thing again. Presumably another hour in prayer. Verse 44 says the same thing. He said the same thing one more time. Presumably three hours this night in prayer fervent, difficult, blood-sweating prayer. Now, he's not trying to wear God down, but there is a completeness to his praying. He's bringing this matter before the Father, and there's no rock he hasn't overturned. Three times he prays. There's, there's, new, there's, there's meaning to numbers in Scripture. 
Holy, 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 we sang earlier. That comes from Isaiah chapter 6. The, the angels that flit about the throne of God declare him holy, 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 three times holy, completely holy. Three is the number of completion. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and the Trinity, completely God. Jesus prays three times. I think there's some significance to that. He prays through this matter completely. He explores every aspect of it with the Father, connects with every, every fiber of his being with the Father. There is no stone left unturned. And there's a commitment here. This is not some kind of throwaway popcorn prayer. Oh God, will you help me? Oh God, will you give me strength? Oh God, will you be with me in this moment? Now, if that's the best you can do, getting ready to be thrown into the, the pit of vipers, and that's all you can do is fire a little popcorn prayer off, good, do it. But a lot of believers try to subsist their prayer life on a bowl of popcorn on a regular basis. And there's a level of commitment here. With every ounce of who he is, Jesus is distressed to his soul, to the core of who he is. With every ounce of his being, he is committed, praying fervently. And by the way, Jesus didn't just turn first to God when things were difficult. You remember that time when he fed the 5,000? Here is a, a huge ministry win, right? This is a, a big moment, a big victory. High fives all around for the disciples. This was a big moment. Now, according to Mark's gospel, what did he do after that? He puts the disciples in a boat, and he sends them off. And where does Jesus go? Up on a mountain to be by himself, to pray. Following a big win, Jesus didn't just turn to the Father when things were going poorly, when, when he was distressed. In every moment in between, the high point and the low point, in every point, his first stop was to connect with the Father. There's something instructive for us in that. that Jesus' first stop was to the Father. And isn't it interesting, I think, that in the times when you and I need God the most, maybe the extreme highs of life, when we're tempted to forget about him and think we've done it all on our own, the extreme lows of life where we're, where we're tempted to say, God has forgotten about me, the times when we need him the most are often the times that we seek him the least. Isn't that the interesting thing about our walk? Those times when we need to lean into him the most are the very times that I don't feel like praying. Or when things are going extremely well off the feeding of the 5,000, I don't need to pray, I got this. Those times when we need him the most are the times we call on him the least. And, and we'll turn everywhere to everything except God, right? We'll wait till we get to the end of our rope because we've turned to everything else before then and found it wanting. Turn to our family. We'll turn to our friends. We'll turn to that latest book or that latest podcast. We'll turn everywhere. And you see, well, Jesus took his friends with him. Yeah, he did. He took Peter, James, and John with him, his inner circle. He said, come with me. He took his friends with him. And don't neglect that. It's a great source of encouragement. But Jesus knew full well the lesson that you and I have experienced over the course of our lives, that though he brought his friends with him, they ultimately would fail. They were not going to be faithful warriors in this moment. He knew that was going to, to happen. Now, don't be too hard on the disciples. I think it's easy for us to look at the what knuckleheads. They're there with Jesus, and he's talking about this is what, what's the lie ahead. They know where this is heading. How could they fall asleep in that moment? I wouldn't have done that if I were in the garden. That's kind of how the, the attitude we can have about the disciples. I don't think we ought to be too hard on them, just like you and me. There will come a time when our friends will let us down. There will come a time when our family members will let us down. When they'll forget. When they'll no longer be thinking about the needs that we have or the prayers that we have asked them to pray about. There will come a time when just like the disciples, and you and I will do this too, when we'll fall asleep. In the very hour when we ought to be there, we'll fall asleep. And then in verse 56, the disciples did the absolute worst thing imaginable for a friend. They abandoned him. Every one of them turned and scattered and abandoned him. And I think here's a, here's a takeaway from that moment. That when we come to God first, that God not only has the answer, but God is the answer. Now listen, if you write nothing else down today, write that down. God not only has the answer, he is the answer. 
the answer. Psalm 46, the psalmist said this, God is my refuge. He is my strength. Now, he will give us refuge and protection of things in this life. He will give us strength in his life. Those things are true. But he is our refuge, and he is our strength. Isaiah 46, he knows the beginning from the end, and by the way, every point in between. He is the answer. John chapter 6, Peter makes this profound statement. Many people who had followed Jesus were told there in the tail end of John chapter 6, turn and decide they don't want to follow him anymore. And Jesus turns to the disciples and he said, are y'all going to go too? And Peter said this, where else are we going to go? You and you alone have the words of life. God not only has the answer to whatever it is that you are experiencing, he is the answer to whatever it is you are experiencing. And the lesson of faith, I think, for us is that Jesus' first course of action in the high points, in the low points, in every point, his first course of action was to seek the Father. Turn to God as your first stop, not as your last resort. The second lesson, I think, is this. Trust him with the outcome. Now, that's a little easier to say than it is to do, isn't it? Trust him with the outcome. Every time Jesus prayed here in the garden, he prayed the same phrase. Not my will, but yours be done. He says it in verse 39, verse 42, verse 44. Now this is the place, that prayer, when you say that phrase, when you mean it, by the way, when you say that phrase to God, this is where faith gets real, isn't it? It's also the place that faith gets a little scary, doesn't it? Not my will, but yours be done. There are things that go on in our head and go on in our heart, words that would never come out our mouths. But we have this, this, this doubt, this nagging doubt in our hearts. That if I say that, not my will but yours be done, what's God going to do with this? What is God going to ask me to do with this? What is he going to ask me to do, period? And the question that we don't want to ask, but the question that drives all of those is this, do I really trust God enough to let him have his way? That's that, what that prayer means, not my will, but yours be done. That, Lord, I trust you enough to let you have your way, whatever that looks like. This is the place where we often superimpose our disappointments of this life onto God. And we say, well, listen, people have, have hurt me. The people have let me down, and I wonder then if God's not going to do that too. Or say, people have not always been good to me, and I wonder maybe if God is like that too. The truth of Scripture is that sometimes He'll get us out of difficulty. That's the reality. Sometimes God will change the circumstances so, so that difficulty goes away. We no longer have it. Sometimes He will do that, but sometimes He'll leave us in it. You realize that's exactly what happened in Gethsemane. Jesus prayed three times, Lord, let this cup pass from before me. The answer from God the Father, no. I'm sorry, son. This is the way it must be done. God did not get him out of it. Now, I would be a little bit neglectful if I didn't say just a word about what, that, what I believe that meant. When Jesus said, Father, let this cup pass from before me, what was he talking about in that moment. You know, we can't go into all of the, the details and the whys and wherefores of that. Some people think that he was praying to avoid the cross. If there's any other way than the cross, Father, let it be so. But as he said, the cross is why he came. He was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, before Adam and Eve, and before the serpent in the garden, before the fruit. Jesus knew about the cross. Seems unthinkable then. Then in the moments right before it, he would say, um, Dad, is there another way for us to do this? From all of eternity past, the cross has been plan A. I don't think it was the cross he was, he was praying about. Some say it might have been the suffering. He was praying to avoid the, the suffering, but I don't think it was that either. Isaiah 53 designates Jesus, the, the Messiah, as the suffering servant. The suffering that he would go through was a very part of how we would know he was the Messiah. And there have been many who have been called by the, by the Lord himself to suffer 
further faith, it's almost unthinkable to think that he wouldn't want to do that. He wouldn't be willing to do that himself. Here's what I believe he was praying for. His prayer was this, the gospel according to St. Barry. I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase it for you. Father, I don't look forward to being the object of your wrath. I don't look forward to having the full strength of your wrath for all the sins of all of mankind poured out on me. Now, I wasn't second-guessing on Jesus' part. It was a statement of reality. For the one moment in all of eternity, there would be something that stood between him and the Father. That was not a moment that he would have looked forward to. Not a moment he would have been thrilled about. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. Sin, the object of God's wrath. And for that moment on the cross, that would be Jesus. Bearing the sins of all mankind. The psalmist and the prophets and the book of the Revelation all refer to the wrath of God as being poured out of a cup. It was the wrath of God that Jesus said, if there's any other way, Father, I don't really look forward to being the object of your wrath, even for the briefest moment. The hardest thing he would ever face. Something that would stand between him and the Father for just that moment on the cross. But here's the thing. He comes to that moment, he says, Father, I don't look forward to this. This is not a moment that will, that will really, really tickle me but I trust you with the outcome. I trust you completely, not my will, but yours be done. He may not always get us out of situations. He may not take us out of the, the difficulty, but he always gets us through it every single time. Friends will let us down. Family will let us down. But God has an unstained, untainted track record of faithfulness question there is, is your faith and mine strong enough to make that statement in prayer? Not my will, but yours be done. To put that situation in God's hands and leave it there. It's a lesson of faith for us in the Garden of Gethsemane. To turn to God first and not as our last resort. To leave those matters in his hands. And then lastly, very quickly, to take comfort in the fact that he's been there. Whatever it is, your darkest hour in life, whatever that darkest moment is, he's been there. Is your darkest hour that you're suffering loss? Jesus has been there. All of his friends abandon him at that moment. He has felt loss. Is your darkest hour you're suffering betrayal? One of them that was closest to him, that had been with him for the three years, was the very one who sold him out. Jesus has suffered betrayal. He knows what it's like. Are you suffering physically? He suffered physically, perhaps worse than anyone who has ever been. He knows what that is like. Injustice, hate, he knows what that feels like. Whatever our darkest hour is, whatever our most difficult circumstance is, Jesus understands it. He's been there. And that point is so important that the Holy Spirit saw to it that we get a glimpse of this very intimate, difficult time in Jesus' life so that we understood that point, that whatever it is, when we face some of those things ourselves, we can remember God understands. He knows. How, does, how do we know He knows? Because He's been there. He has, he has dealt with it all himself. Now, there are those who might ask the question then, if God understands our suffering so well, he understands the pain and the injustice and the hate and the difficulty that goes in this world, if he understands it so well, then why doesn't he do something about it? Why doesn't he stop it? Why does he say that's enough? I've seen enough of that. I won't stand for that anymore. Why doesn't he stop those things if he understands it so well? Well, this is another one of those areas that we could spend the next several hours unpacking that little truth, but I think here's the answer in a nutshell. This is why God doesn't stop it. Because for God to stop evil, he would stop everything he considers evil. Now, I think very often we come with that question. We want to hold God accountable for stopping the bad things in this world, but we want to define what that list looks like. 
I want you to stop this and this and this, Lord. And now, now there are some places that our list of evil things and his lists are going to overlap. Murder, that's going to be on both people's list. Rape, child abuse, those are going to be on both people's list. But there are a great number of things that we would not necessarily consider evil, but certainly God would. Proverbs chapter 6, the proverb writer said this, There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Now, if we're going to say, God, I expect you to stop all the evil that happens in the world, things that are an abomination to him would make the list, wouldn't they? Listen to what the proverb writer says. Haughty eyes. That's when you're kind of looking down at somebody. Hmm, I'm so much better than you. You, you roll your eyes. Then, God, I can't believe they were so stupid to say such a thing. Haughty eyes are an abomination to the Lord. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked schemes. Feet that are quick to rush into evil. And a false witness who pours out lies. And a person who stirs up conflict in the community. An abomination to God. Proverbs 16, he goes on, everyone who is proud of heart is an abomination. Now, you may not see yourself in all of those, but certainly every one of us sees ourselves in some of those, right? And here's the thing, that if God's going to stop the evil in the world, he's going to start with those things that he declares to be an abomination. He said, wouldn't the world be a better place without all of those things? Well, maybe on one hand, yes, it would be a better place. But, but God knows that for that to happen, he has to take away our rights to choose, our ability to choose to be the kind of people he's called us to be, to be obedient to his word. We, he's got to take away our ability to choose any of those things. We become nothing more than, than robots. And any, any relationship worth having, any love worth having, only matters if it's chosen. The fact that this woman, this beautiful woman in the front row, the fact that she chooses to love me makes it all that more special. If God took away our right to choose, our ability to choose to be the people he wants us to be, our love becomes nothing more, our relationships become nothing more than not husband and wife who choose to love each other on the, sitting on the couch, we become two laptops sitting next to each other, two iPads sitting next to each other. We respond that way because we have no choice in the matter. Any love worth having, any relationship worth having demands that a choice is there. That choice, unfortunately, also comes with it a negative consequence. Sometimes we can choose to not do those things. We, cannot, we can choose to not be loving, not be kind, not be compassionate. The only thing that makes love worth having is that it's chosen. And it's sort of a strange paradox. God loves us too much to stop all of those things in this world. He says this, though. In order for me to stop all of that evil that would happen, I'd have to create a world where love doesn't really exist. I absolutely can't do that. God is love. His world must reflect love. I don't want to do that, but I've got a better deal for you. I've got a better deal. There will be times when people won't act loving. There will be times when people will act horrible to one another. And I've got a better deal for you. Rather than taking away real love out of this world, how about if I walk with you in a way that you know I understand it? I can, I can show you compassion because I've been there. I can sustain you and support you in this because I've been there. I know that sin is real. I know it has innocent victims. It cost me perhaps more than anyone. It cost me my very son. I know about the cost of sin. Suffering is real and it hurts and I know that because I've been there. I can minister to you in the midst of it because I've experienced it. If all these things are real, God would say, yes, they exist. Sometimes people are jerks. But here's the thing. There's hope. There is hope in the midst of all of that. God has been there, and we know because of that there is hope. God is real. God is good. God is sovereign. And he can sustain us through all of those things. This is why we're collecting these little stuffed animals for kindness. There are people who would take them and go visit people in this world who, who have been on the receiving end of this injustice and this hate and the worst things of life, hurt and scarred and beaten down by this world. And they'll take these little stuffed animals and they'll share this message. God knows. 
He hasn't forgotten about you. He's been there. He knows what that feels like. And by the way, there's hope. Life, unfortunately, even the Christian life, is not always daffodils and unicorns. Sometimes it's hard, right? It's really, really hard at times. But in those times, especially in those times, we can turn to God. Turn to God first. He can handle it. And we can trust Him. He not only can handle it, He will handle it. And in the best way. And we can be comforted to know that He knows the way. He will lead us in the way. He's been there. The question in those times for us is not can we. Can we turn to God? Can we trust God? Can we understand that He knows it? The question is not can we, but will we? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the reminder for the reminder that our faith can be built on these things, that we can turn to you first and last and every step in between, and you'll always be there for us. Father, that our faith is built on the fact that you want us to turn to you, that you want us to bring our concerns to you, and that we can trust you with the results every single time. Father, we thank you that our faith can be built on the fact that you are a God who understands everything that we're going through. And so you can minister to us in a way that is real. Fathers, we enter these next few moments, this time of invitation. What I realize, there may be one here this morning that doesn't know all of those things are true because they don't have a personal relationship with never trusted in you they never they can't call you abba father because that's not the relationship they have and fathers we enter this time of invitation lord i pray that you would convict their hearts and give them the boldness to step out and just come down and say i need to know jesus i need to know god as father father many in this room know you as lord and savior but so many times we forget just the little simple truths of faith we treat you as a last resort rather than our first place to go. We can always trust you with the things of our lives. We forget that you understand what we're going through. And Father, I just want to pray that this time of invitation would be a time when we can bring those failures to you, experience your forgiveness, your endless forgiveness, your mercies that are new every morning be restored unto you and give us, help us even in our unbelief. Father, would you continue to speak in these next few moments as we have this time of invitation. I pray in Jesus' name.